Okay, yeah, welcome to the Roots and Resilience session, September 22nd. <clears throat> so the, the session we were going to look at today is on spirals of abundance. How long do we have, by the way, Sophie? How long's in the timetable? I didn't actually look at it. I've given you 30 minutes, so you can expand. Okay, as much as wonderful. So till 1740, roughly. Uh, till 1750. Oh, yep. Okay. Cool. I don't know we need that long, but let's see what we can fill in. Um, so I guess, first of all, before we start looking at spirals of abundance, maybe it's useful for us to look at spirals of destruction. And um, well, just mute my phone so it doesn't keep making noises. Yeah, so maybe it's worthwhile looking at spirals of destruction first so that we can see what it is we're looking to try and circumvent and, you know, and create richness rather than destruction. So if we maybe maybe we can start by looking at how spirals of destruction work in nature. So as we know, everything gardens, everything has a repercussion, everything affects multiple things around it. And so if we take a, a scenario such as um, an agricultural field. So the agricultural field starts with nutrients, you know, uh, so at the beginning, you know, before it was converted to being an agricultural field, it has some nutrients in there. It's probably full of life. It's probably full of different bacteria and insects and so on and so forth. And there's probably some other larger animals maybe passing through. And the, uh, yeah, a kind of conventional farmer will then till the soil, turn it in order to aerate it, in order to clear it so that they can then plant their crop and what happens in this process is the 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 yeah the, the organic matter breaks down and starts creating some nutrients which uh, then really makes the vegetables grow really well the farmer then takes that produce full of nutrients and sells it and off it goes out of the system so next year, the farmer will try and plow the field again and you know, uh, does the same thing, puts, um, yeah, puts their crop in, it grows, the nutrients go into the crop, the crop is collected and off it goes. Continuously doing this, as we know, will eventually lead to a complete depletion of nutrients in the soil. So what does a farmer do? So once there's not enough nutrients left in the soil to really grow their produce, what do they do? Put some fertilizer. <laughs> Add some kind of fertilizer. So bring in some kind of chemical, perhaps fertilizer in and, um, and yeah, and yeah, basically grows the food using this fertilizer. Now the fertilizer itself, uh, is typically just three nutrients, NKP, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphates. And they're typically chemically made. So the way in which different animals and insects and bacteria have a relationship with these, uh, this type of, this type of uh, nutrient is not very healthy. It's not very supportive of these insects, but still they try. And um, and obviously the other side of the story is as the uh, as the nutrients start to diminish and the type of nutrients that are available change, all of a sudden uh, the the quality of the soil starts to depreciate, which means that the amount of life that's in there also depreciates, and then all of a sudden. Uh, very opportunistic plants that need very little nutrients that uh, replicate themselves very, very quickly um, uh, start to arrive, the pioneer plants. 
and how does the and how welcome are they in a conventional farmer's scenario? What what do they call them even? Weeds. They're called weeds, and they're of no use to the farmer. So what does the farmer do? Oh. Herbicides. Yeah, puts in some chemicals to try and kill them. Herbicides, or herbicides if you're American. Um, so, so in putting those herbicides, do they only kill weeds? Or do they also kill? Probably toxic to a lot of the soil life as well. Absolutely. So it kills the life. So now, in order to deal with the you know so the reason why the weeds have come is because they've cleared the land they've um yeah uh, made the land bare uh and so the result of which is different plants come to try and colonize to try and repair that this then in turn uh you know uh, the, the the farmer considers to be a weed and therefore they consider it to be a problem. So they put in chemicals to try and kill those, but in doing, in killing the weeds, they also kill the rest of the life. So, and this life was basically breaking down organic matter and eating and pooping and eating pooping and creating life, creating more uh, bacteria, which, which basically feeds the soil, which releases minerals and nutrients and therefore feeds the plants. So now all of a sudden, the quality of the soil is even more depreciated and more depreciated. And this cycle continues. So this is a spiral of destruction. So as in order to clear, in order to get a, a just one monocrop, they've cleared the field, which has reduced the amounts of nutrients, which has reduced the amount of life. Opportunistic plants come, weeds, in order to kill those. That creates, um, uh, yeah, in order to kill those, they use uh, herbicides, which then kill even more life. And the quality of the soil just gets worse and worse and worse and worse until the soil is dead. And that's a clear spiral of destruction. Um, in order to meet one particular aim, i.e. a big monoculture crop, uh, one thing has led to the next, 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 which has basically effectively completely killed the soil and killed all the life in it. What other spirals of destruction do we see in this modern world of ours? Where else can you see this kind of pattern? In order to get one thing, they do one particular action, which leads to something else, which leads to something else, which eventually just doubles back on itself to make the whole scenario worse and worse and worse. How about something social? Economics and crime, perhaps? Would anyone like to put that together? So many examples. Mm -hmm. So what about marginalized people? Mm -hmm. Someone grows up uh, economically disadvantaged. They um, don't have so many opportunities. They find it hard to, um, to fit into society, to get a job, to meet their basic needs. Um, they have to search for alternative behaviors to meet their needs. These are frowned upon by the society. They are punished for doing something that is uh, not seen as acceptable. Um, by being punished, they have even less opportunities. They start to be more outside of the society. And then they have to do more things, which are again, more and more outside of society. And they find it more and more and more difficult to meet their needs and to have opportunities and to fit in. Great. Any other 
examples? The healthcare system as well, or the um, pharmaceutical way of treating illnesses, um, where um, we depend on medications that then um, sort of make us uh, ad yeah. I guess addicted to the lifestyles that we try to, um, and then we become even more dependent on that type of seeking our help. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we see in this modern kind of lifestyle, these spirals of destructions are everywhere. There's and so many examples. Sorry, Belinda? Food as well, where they're making all this sort of fast foods that have got all these um, flavour enhancers and things that make it attractive and people get addicted to it and want more and it's easy and they're just not getting the nutrition and they're just getting iller and iller and then you know eating more of this stuff that that's got flavor enhancers monosodium glutamate and things and not eating nice healthy vegetables absolutely so these things are everywhere and um you know in uh, in our personal lives i'm sure we've kind of kicked off some spirals of destruction as well you know so one inappropriate choice of words uh, has led to a misunderstanding which has led to some kind of feedback which has then kind of triggered us even more and we feedback and they feedback and all of a sudden we've got this real crazy scenario such as um i know for example if uh i don't know so, so imagine you're yeah you've had a really really hard day at work yeah, your boss is really being a real pain and uh, and you're just so looking forward to going home and your partner is just, you know, thinking, ah, oh, you know what, special day, I'm going to cook something really special for my partner, something really that they really love. And, and just as you're about to leave work, your boss says, ah, no, something's emergency, you need to come and fix this, you need to do this before you leave, this is urgent. And it's like, ah, oh, okay, okay. And so out of some sense of uh, responsibility you agree and you do the work and then when you finally finish you're on your way home and you have to go by train and uh, the train breaks down and it's like the middle of summer and it's hot and it's sticky and you're like just like ah oh, now and people are coughing and sneezing all over you and you get home and you're in such a bad mood and uh, your partner serves up this meal which is now cold and it's uh, dry and it's like not and it's like there's not enough salt in it why why do you always make my food without enough salt how can you how, what, you know how i like it ah. and what do you mean you don't have enough salt you could have you could always add salt i can't take salt away it's too salty for me i taste ah, 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 ah. in this kind of you know um crazy spiral that uh, just gets out of hand and out of control is that familiar or oh, you've never done that before have you no no maria marianne has never done that is that true vince Vansel? <laughs> no comment look what a uh, politic yeah smart move smart move <laughs> so uh <coughs> so yeah we all do this you know um it's got nothing to do with the, the salt in the food. It's got nothing to do with this amazing meal that our partners prepared for us. It's to do with so many other things, but just one wrong word in the wrong place because of some other situation has led to, to yeah, to, to you saying something that you probably, you know, in different circumstances, you would never have said, but that's just led to this kind of crazy spiral. So um what we can start thinking about is how do we if we notice that we started that how do we turn that around how do we change that situation and so what we want to do is we want to instead of creating more another or continuing this spiral of destruction we want to see what interaction can we make to instead bring about a spiral of abundance so 
real life example um <clears throat> there's an activist friend of mine who uh we've done all kinds of really crazy activist things together back in the day and uh and it was really fun it was really dynamic it was you know it was risky it was dangerous it was uh it was fun we, we really had some magic moments should we say um and we were planning some project and we had completely different ideas as to how this project should go really it's long before i knew anything about sociocracy uh, we had really different opinions about how the best way to make this project happen and but it was in the days of email and uh, so we started emailing each other it's and it just started getting hotter and hotter and it's like oh come on how can you uh, 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 you know that's, that just doesn't make sense if you do that it's gonna leak. come on can't you see that uh, you know and uh, the messages were just getting hotter and hotter and hotter and i could see wow one more wrong email and this is going to be the end of this really amazing long friendship so first thing to do pause don't react breathe consider the situation what's more important that i get my way uh, of doing this um that i avoid getting into getting the, the project into difficulty because i can see that if we did it the other way it would lead to something that was really not productive and not useful uh but you know what is it that i how is it that i can kind of you know prevent that without losing a friendship so the next message i sent to her was hey you know i've told you so many times how much i love you how much i really love working with you the things that we have done were just so magical you know we we've really had some fun in the past and i really respect you and i really love you however on this particular situation i really think that if we do that it will lead to this which is really not going to be useful to us it's it's actually going to be detrimental to our project so i'd really like to look at this properly immediately got a response back saying hey rakesh of course i love you you're my brother we've just you know yeah we've, we've done some amazing things together um but i really believe <laughs> and so you know so but we were now able to have a conversation about the actual subject and to work out where is where is the kind of uh how do we do choose one scenario which is now safe having heard each other's uh concerns how is it that we can deliver this in a safe way that doesn't lead to something that is really um problematic and we're still kind of friends so um so really stopping and thinking about what is it that I can interject into the system, into this spiral of destruction? How is it that I can influence this spiral of destruction to turn it around, to turn it into a spiral of abundance instead? So we've got about 10, 13 minutes. Um, maybe we can do a little exercise. Maybe we can start thinking about a scenario. Maybe we can look at the first scenario of the agricultural spiral of destruction to see what is it that we could do to intervene in there? What, what is it that we could do that stops the spiral of destruction and starts to bring forth some kind of spiral of abundance instead? What do you think we could do in a, as an yeah, to kind of prevent this kind of agricultural depletion, you know, having to rely on pesticides and so on and so forth? Compost the weeds. 
So first of all is, yeah, so maybe could we dig up and compost those weeds and return them back into the soil somehow? It's one little trick, yep, what else? Plant. Plants are something we want in there instead of the, well, that would, that would like the conditions or would replenish the soil or leave the, leave the weeds. <laughs> Absolutely. So if we were clever enough and we still wanted some kind of a significant monoculture for whatever reason, perhaps could we plant some kind of ground cover that doesn't interfere with the monoculture crop? And could that ground cover actually be some kind of a polyculture? Could it be a real mix of different low growing uh, crops that uh, may not even be crops? They could just be they're just as dynamic accumulators and, you know, uh, bio, you know, you know, create increase in the biodiversity. So uh, insect attractors and all the rest of it that then helps to create a much richer soil which then traps in moisture that brings in life and the life as you know begets life so once you've got insects in the system each insect each bacteria is made up of moisture so they're actually when they you know as they die they release moisture back into the system as, as they grow new and die grow and die eat and poop eat and poop uh, everything starts to come back into balance again, even though we're still producing some kind of a monoculture crop, but using a kind of polyculture ground cover. Very interesting. Very nice scenario. Anything else on that? Or should we move on to the, what was the second scenario? The um, marginalised peoples. So anything else on the kind of, planting before we move on i think that's a good example i think that's yeah like if you think about stopping digging and filling the niches that's like a pretty good like stop point to turn things around what about even reconsidering the monoculture yield and actually going more towards a polyculture yield per se Yeah, you can go really big. <laughs> so, yeah, you can stop and you can start a food forest. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Everyone needs a food forest. So, um, so yeah, so that that probably would be the strategy that I would aim for is is really to rather than just a monoculture yield is to really think about a full polyculture yield such as a food forest. Wonderful. So what about the, yeah, the second scenario of marginalized people? How do we solve that? So do you want to remind us of the pattern? So you have marginalized people not getting, well, you, you remind us. So we've got marginalized people. Sorry, Marty, you wanted to say. Go ahead. Sorry, I have a bit of a lag on my um, internet. So I'm speaking over people. Um, so if it's the example that I brought up, so you've got people who maybe are born into a situation with less opportunities, and then through the education system, they again don't really manage to thrive there. They leave that system with less opportunities. It's harder for them to get a job. Uh, it's harder for them to meet their needs to survive they end up having to do things which are considered like not acceptable in society they get further marginalized they maybe get criminalized and then it's really really hard for them to participate in society if we go for the full spiral in, invite them into some sort of thing like a youth group that's got something that connect, they can connect with, to connect with others and share the love. 
you know, yeah, like, maybe like really rethinking the education system because yeah it's something that is really just replicating a lot a lot of inequality and it's something that's like labeling people from a really young age and like sorting them into you know like good workers and effective people and it's really disgusting so yeah i think that would be like a stop point like how early can you stop it yep yeah so what you often see in any spiral of destruction, the sooner you stop that spiral from getting out, out of control, the, the sooner you intervene with it, the easier it is to deal with. The, the deeper it goes into the spiral, the harder and harder and harder it gets to start and resolve it. So, yes, yeah, so if we can uh, somehow engage people who are somehow marginalised at the beginning, rather than allowing them to be marginalized you know so if we actually bring them into society and really value whatever it is they have to offer the uh yeah the less chances are they will you know feel the only option they have is to do things that are you know perhaps criminal or um you know or just really were frowned on by by society so um yeah, really making them feel valued. And, you know, if they, they feel valued, if they can contribute, then, um, you know, that gives them self-confidence, that gives them self-worth and just has a huge knock-on effect to society. Wonderful. And what was the, the next one? Was it about health? Health and well-being. So who'd like to look at that? So how do we resolve a kind of health spiral of destruction. It's interesting, like the similarities in that it starts a lot in addressing the root causes. So just like starting at the beginning, um, where we often see it's illness, uh, we try to address the symptoms, so like a pain or something, um, and just to kind of numb that pain, maybe. So starting back to what. Um, I think it's more in a health focused how to have a healthy system and goes back to the roots I guess. Mm -hmm. I think yeah there's also a lot of overlap with the previous example so like if you're thinking about like an alternative to the education system instead of thinking okay let's teach everyone some supposedly standard set of things and then they'll be able to go and get a job and with that job they'll be able to have money and with that money they'll be able to buy things to meet their needs like food like paying their rent like their water bills like their medicine like what about teaching children about meeting their needs or about teaching them about how to grow food about how to keep water clean about how to have community um, something that all children would be able to understand and see how it's relevant because it's something that we all need every day and it's something that needs like a really rich set of skills um, so you don't just need people whose parents have a lot of time to support them with reading and homework and buying books and other things that kind of exclude a lot of people it's something you can really understand and it's something really practical and I think the more that we're connected, yeah, like to our bodies and to food and to like healthy movement and enjoying being in nature, that's going to like make such a big change with the way that we understand health, I think, and this kind of alienated way that we kind of have like ourself, our body, the world, all those kind of separate spheres um, and that sickness is something that kind of happens to us from the outside. Brilliant. Okay, so we've got two minutes left. Is there anything else anyone would like to bring in to this conversation about spirals of abundance and spirals of destruction? I'm just worried about that guy who was freaking out that there wasn't enough salt in his dinner. What are we going to do with him? Um, I guess at either side needs to kind of take a step back and recognize that the problem isn't the salt, it isn't the food. 
And I guess if it was the, the person, could have been male, could have been man, could have been a woman, who knows? Um, it's just hypothetical. But whoever had a rough day at work could stop and say to their partner, um, hey, it's, yeah, thank you for this food. I really appreciate the fact that you've made this effort to make my favorite meal. I've just had a really hard day. I'm really pissed off for, because of X, Y, and Z. But I really appreciate the fact that you made this effort to make that meal for me. And I guess that's the, that's the spiral of abundance in there. Yeah. How, really... how the other person could have initiated that? Perhaps they could have said, I don't know, perhaps they could have just said, okay, is this something you need to talk about? I guess you've had a hard day, yeah? Because uh, I know you like this meal. And um, perhaps there's something else you want to get off your chest first, and then we can talk about the food. Yeah. Something very simple that someone said to me once that helped me a lot, um, if I'm like freaking out and going into a bad spiral, is like, this is your life. Like, I don't know, just it reminds me, like, this is my life. It's the only one I've got. And do I really want this moment in my life to be like this? And another thing, like, just because you could react in that way, just because maybe it's justified, doesn't mean you have to. You know, like, if someone else is shouting at you, or like, that person's shouting at me. I'm totally justified to shout back and also, like, do that. And it's like, yeah, maybe you are, but this is your life. Do you want to really be doing that? And that often helps me a lot. I'm like, oh, and he's like, okay, but I can choose, yeah. So, a really yeah. lovely friend of mine who teaches meditation and is, yeah, it's just a really lovely character, uh, but teaches real meditation. He's a, a, an actual, like a monk, a uh, meditation monk. He says when, some, when he gets into this kind of, you know, bad spiraling, he sees someone who is just really obnoxious and really, uh, and he just wants to shout and scream. And he he thinks, God must love this person too. That's it. God must also love this person. So even though I don't understand it and I can't see it, but if God loves this person, I should love this person too. And that kind of stops. <laughs> so I don't know if that works for you, but it, it works for him. So, wonderful. Thanks very much. Um, as you probably guessed, I was just totally making that up. I didn't actually have a session plan or anything. Um, and I'm surprised that we actually did manage to take up the full half an hour. Well done, everyone. <laughs> cool. Okay. Right. Back over to Sophie. Well, thanks for that, Rakesh. Now we have a break. Cool. I was going to say, I was oh, going to stop the recording. Right. Yeah, we have a break for the next 10 minutes, and then we will come back on the hour to speak about compostability. Wonderful.